here's, here's what I've seen here in India. And in a way, it's even more tragic here, actually. Because Yahaki Sanskriti Jale, Yahaka Sanskar, they are the ones that actually are rooted in teaching our children that the core of who you are is divine. Whereas in the West, actually, without going into too much of the sociologic aspects of it, there's much more of a sense that who you are is what you create. Whereas in the East, there's much more of a sense of the core of who you are is divine. And therefore, in theory, if we actually all were rooted in our own tradition, in our own Sanskriti, in our own Sanskars, if we all were actually living and teaching our children that which we claim to believe, that which we pray in our houses of worship, that which we chant, we wouldn't really have this problem. The dilemma is that we have actually forgotten that in our child rearing, and we have started to rear our children into believing that they are what they do. Now, most parents will say, no, 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 no. And in most parents' heart, they don't believe it. But watch in a very simple way what it looks like. A child comes home from school, They've brought a fantastic grade on an exam or a fantastic grade on a report card. What happens? Mom, super smiley, happy, embraces the child, maybe makes him or her cookies and lots of hugs and kisses and tells the dad, tells the family, oh, look, your child has gotten this great mark. Lots of love. Then what happens? At another time, that child brings home a failure grade. That child brings home, as the girl that you just mentioned, brings home a few marks less. And what happens? Suddenly the mother, not love, not love. That, that love has been withdrawn. There's a sense of somehow mom is disappointed. Somehow I am responsible for mom's disappointment. And what our children learn at a very early age is who I am, my value as a human being, my value of being loved is based on what I'm doing, based on the marks that I'm getting, it's even as small as, oh, you cleaned up your room. Your mom's good boy. Your mom's good girl. Oh, you didn't clean up your room. You're a bad boy. You're a bad girl. Little, simple, innocuous things. And what happens? We grow up with this sense that who I am is what I do. My worthiness of love is based on what I do. Because here we are talking about things in the world. We can't control the things of the world. There is nothing that is in our control other than our own mind and our own reactions. And as long as our sense of peace, our sense of joy, our sense of success, our sense of fulfillment, our happiness is rooted in something outside of ourselves. We're setting ourselves up for misery. And as long as we think that by somehow controlling things in the world outside, that we can somehow find that joy and happiness and peace and fulfillment. We're just delaying, delaying ourselves from actually being able to experience it because we then move through the world continuing to try to control things. When I was a kid, there was a game that was a very, very popular game in the arcades. It was 
you know, the 1970s, early 80s, before they had lots and lots of high-tech video games. There were some video games, but nothing as, as high-tech as we have today. And there was a, a game that we all played that was called Whack-A-Mole. And it was a game in which you had a hammer and there were lots of holes. And out of one hole, the little head of a little furry creature would pop up and you had to take your hammer and you had to bop it down on the head and get it to go down. And every time you did that, another head would pop out from a different hole and then you would bop that down and then another one would come and you'd bop it down. And as you got better, the heads would pop up more and more, faster and faster, and ultimately it had to do with basically how many heads you could pop down before the time ran out or before you missed a certain number. I don't remember how it actually ended up ending. But life has become like that. When our, our vision of success, our vision of happiness, our vision of peace is rooted in controlling things in the world around us. Whether it's how people around us speak to us, act toward us, how they live their own lives, whether it's the weather, whether it's the traffic, whether it's the stock market, whether it's the lockdown, whatever it may be, if my internal sense of happiness and peace is rooted in something outside, my life becomes like the whack-a-mole game where I'm able to control this over here. I've whacked down, okay, manage the traffic situation, move to a place closer to work. Then here comes the annoying colleague situation. Okay, whacked that down, got them fired or changed my job. Then I've got another thing and they keep popping up. Then it's the in-law, then it's the spouse or the lack of a spouse. Then it's the children or the lack of, a ch of children. Then it's the stock market. Then it's everything. And they just keep popping up. And our whole lives become about trying to control, trying to control, trying to change everything outside so that I can feel at peace inside. And that's the dilemma. And that's where we end up with misery and anxiety. Because, yeah, it gets your heart pounding. Gets all of that going. It's anxiety producing and eventually it produces depression because the truth is you can't win at that. We cannot control the world. And if I've determined that the only way I'm going to feel happy, peaceful, successful, is if I'm able to get everything else in the world to do jase me chati hun, jab me chati hun, jitna me chati hun, jistra se me chati hun. Well, so I'm going to be unhappy. I'm going to make everybody around me unhappy. And so this is where it's so important to realize the only thing we have control over is our own minds. There's a beautiful teaching in the scriptures that says, Man eva manushya nam karanam bandha mokshayo. The mind is the key. It's the key to our bondage. It's the key to our freedom. And that's where it's so essential for our youth to learn the keys as we teach them how to do math, as we teach them how to use their hands and their arms to play the piano or to write cursive or to write beautiful Devanagari or whatever we're teaching them to do or to ride a bicycle. We teach them to use their legs to dance or to run or to pedal that bicycle. In the same way, we have to teach them how to use their minds and how to use their thoughts because the beliefs of depression are the beliefs that say it's helpless, nothing that I do will ever change the current situation. It is pervasive, so it will always be like this. And there is no light at the end of the tunnel. I am, I am my success. I am my career. I am my physical body. I am my bank account. I am my number of followers on social media. And if I am that, 
then as those things go up and down out of my control, my life feels out of my control. And that's where the teaching is so essential, whatever our spiritual practice may be, whatever our spiritual tradition may be. But to come back within, into that inner awareness and sense that who I am is full, is whole, is complete, is divine, is perfect, that God doesn't make mistakes. And that, yeah, that which I do, some of it I'm going to be good at, some of it I'm not going to be so good at. And nature, nature's like that. There's rainy seasons, there's dry seasons, there's hot seasons, there's cold seasons. Some flowers give fragrance, some give fruit, some grow tall, some are small bushes. Some blossom 365 days a year. Some, like the Rat Kirani, blossom only in the night, certain times of the year. But it's all perfect. It's all beautiful. It's all exactly, exactly how it should be. And we have to learn how to train our minds like that. And lastly, Lastly, as parents, as mentors, as teachers, as educators, it is essential that that is what we teach our children, that we never, ever, ever identify them based on what they do, that we never say things like, you are bad or you are stupid or you are this, that we never give them an identity wrapped up in a performance, but that we help them understand you are divine and perfect and whole and complete. And you're not really doing your best in math. So maybe you should study a little harder. But that doesn't change who you are. And the beautiful piece of that is it gives us a beautiful challenge to work with in our own lives because we can only share that which we have. And so when we share that, when we live it, then we're able to pass it on to the youth. And the very last point I want to conclude with is that as humans, we need connection. We need, we need to be in cooperation with each other. It's actually evolutionarily that which has enabled us to continue to evolve so successfully, coming together in community. And these days, competition has become that which is beating out, which is winning over cooperation. We are teaching our youth to compete rather than to cooperate. We are teaching them that it's all about being only number one, pushing everybody else out of the way. And if we can help them understand the value of cooperation, the value of community, the value of connection, that's going to give them the spiritual immunity that they need to make it through whatever happens in life. Physical immunity, we're talking a lot about these days. But that, physic that spiritual immunity comes with our community.